So my name is Gordon Bronson, um, and I'm here to talk to you about something called impact investing. Does anybody here have an idea of what impact investing might be? I'm looking for hands. You, she already has a mic, amazing. Do you want to give me a definition? Or your idea of a definition? Yeah, isn't it invest, like figuring out how to invest in businesses that you're not just investing financially, but in the community and in people and that kind of yeah. thing? Yeah, did everybody hear that? It's a pretty good definition. Investing in companies where you're not just investing in a business, but you're investing in the community and the people. Um, the way I look at it is something called double bottom line returns. You're, you're investing uh, in a for-profit company, um, but you're doing so in a way that also grows communities and helps communities thrive. Okay, this can be done on a very small scale, can be done on a very big scale. Um, so that was a great answer, thank you for that. Um, the other question I wanna ask you guys before we get started, or as we're getting started, can somebody here give me like just a blurb explanation of what happened in the financial crisis in 2008? <laughs> I see one hand back there, but are you a group leader? I want to hear from a red shirt. Come on. Here's raffle tickets in it for you. Okay, yes. Can we hand her a mic? It should, it should be on. Okay, just yell. Just talk loud. Okay. So, why were they doing that? Do you know? That's actually a really solid blurb. Um, and, uh, and that's okay. I can hear. <laughs> we're good. You guys, did you guys all hear that? Okay, so she said basically people were lending money to people that didn't have money and couldn't pay back the loans. That's, does that resonate with people? Does that kind of make sense from what you've heard in the news? Yeah? Okay, so the, the kind of broader answer is that you had a situation where this is, you know, economies grow um, really on a system of, of credit, okay? Loans, debt, and paying back the debt, okay? So you go out and you say, I want to buy, I want to go out and buy a, a new pair of skis at REI. I'm thinking about skiing because it's snow today. I go to REI, I want to buy a new pair of skis. They cost like a thousand bucks. <laughs> Ah, forget it, I got a credit card. I'm gonna buy these skis. And you work and you pay it off over time. Okay, that's a fairly small piece of debt. Now, another way of looking at debt is as an investment in the future. Now, skis aren't really an investment in the future. They're fun, but they're not gonna really, you know, they're fun, but you're not gonna earn anything back on them. Um, by coming here to DU and spending a couple of hundred thousand dollars on education, you're in theory investing in your own future, right? You're saying, I'm gonna do this because I'll be able to pay it back someday because I have a great degree, I have a prestigious name on my, on my diploma, and so I can, I can go out in the world and get a job. Um, buying a house is a little bit of a, of a different kind of investment, right? It, traditionally, when we think about home ownership, we think about going out, you, you, you go to your bank, you say, I wanna get a home loan for a house that's, that's you know, a million bucks and I'm gonna put $100,000 down, I'm gonna get this loan. And the idea is that in five years, that home will appreciate in value, and I'll have earned money off that house. I'll, I'll, I'll reap benefits of that investment. Now, what happened in 2008 is too many people were looking at the housing market as a place to just make money. And so banks were pushing Mortgage companies, okay, so you have banks over here, you have mortgage companies over here. Mortgage companies are out there loaning out money. Banks are pushing mortgage companies to loan riskier and riskier money. Why would they do that? Has anybody heard about this? Something called CDOs, collateralized debt obligations? You heard of this? I promise I'm not talking about finance all night. Okay, so what was going on here was banks realized, bankers realized, people in finance realized somewhere along the way that if they took these home loans away from mortgage companies and broke them up into things called tranches, okay, a tranche is French for trench, but it's like a little, it's a, we call mortgage strips. If we break those up and we sell them off to institutional investors, to private equity firms, those equity firms will make a lot of money off of the interest that people are paying on these homes. So every time somebody makes a payment, the private equity firm gets that money. Right? So banks are pushing mortgage companies to um, give loans to people with poorer and poorer credit. 
Okay, so you have these things called ninja loans. Anybody heard of these? No income, no job, no asset. And when these people were not able to pay back their home loans, the whole system went cr crumbling down. And even people with great credit who were paying back their home loans got really hosed because they lost a job, they lost source of income, their home values depreciated. So just keep that in the back of your head. That's kind of a working definition of what happened in the financial crisis. Keep that in the back of your head, and we're going to come back to it in a little bit. Um, I'm going to tell you guys who I am and why I'm talking to you, give you a little explanation. Um, I started off here. You guys recognize that? OK, so I'm a graduate of DU. Go Pioneers. Um, while I was here, I actually got into politics. So I went and worked on this guy's campaign. Um, and I promise, along with finance, I'm not going to talk too much about politics tonight. Um, and uh, between school and politics, I took some time off. I went skiing. I love to ski. Um, and then after I graduated, I got invited to go work here. And the top of my presentation's cut off. But I think you guys all know what that is, right? OK? Everyone knows? All right, perfect. Um, so when I got to the White House, the White House is a place where um, it's a very, you can imagine it's a very ego-driven place. It's a very tough place. Um, people working there are very competitive. Um, there's, uh, there's not a lot of room for error. And um, I'm going to tell you guys this right now. If at any point, the reason I handed mics to these guys is because if at any point tonight you think that I'm full of it, jump in and say something. Or if you have a question, jump in and say something. Anything you want. Um, I'm talking about stuff tonight that is on the cutting edge of business practices. And if you think that it doesn't make any sense, challenge me. I want to have that conversation with you. Um, in exchange, though, I might just call on you. If I think you guys are dozing off in your food comas from your Chipotle, I might just be like, you, what's your name? Yeah. Chris. Chris. I might just be like, Chris, I'm going to pick on you for the rest of the night. I'm just be like, Chris, what do you think of X? OK? And the reason I do this is because this was a hard lesson that I learned when I kind of got out in the real world. And I realized that I don't know is not an acceptable answer. You got to come up with something. Because everything that I'm talking about tonight is about, I'm going to ask you how it makes you think, how it makes you feel. There's no right or wrong answers. But I want you to engage. I want you to, I want you to get excited about it. Because I'm really excited about it. Um, so when I was at the White House, I, I had the opportunity to work on some, some really neat stuff in, in the field of impact investing. Um, and a lot of this has to do with dealing with complex problems and breaking them down into their kind of simplest common factor and trying to find a solution, OK? So we played a lot with these things called thought clusters. This is a way of thinking that I got really excited about and really into. And a thought cluster is basically this. So you look at a problem, and you say, OK, here are some problems we're dealing with. All right, so we know one problem. One problem is that more children die every year around the world because of indoor smoke inhalation, because of old, rickety, wood-burning stoves. You guys have all seen these, just a, a, simple, a simple kiln oven in the corner of a house. Um, and that kills, that indoor smoke inhalation, the, the side effects of that kill more people than malaria. Now, we talk about malaria a lot. Bono has this big campaign, Project Red, right? And that's all about getting mosquito nets into people's homes in Africa and stopping the spread of malaria and HIV. Okay, so we talk about malaria a lot, but we don't talk about lung disease and lung cancer that goes with this, even though it kills more people. So that was one thing we knew about. Um, and we also knew that women around the world spend an average of six hours a day hunting for water, dealing with water. So they're out seeking out water. They're, they're walking out of their villages and going to wells. Maybe the well close to the village dried up. They have to walk even further. They're carrying it home. Then they're using these carcinogenic stoves <coughs> to boil the water, to make it clean. This is a huge process. And we also know, this isn't up here, but we also know that in developing economies, in any economy, when women are empowered to be entrepreneurs, when women are empowered to grow businesses, economies explode. Uh, when you look at economies that, have, uh, that are extremely male-dominated and women are very suppressed, uh, those economies are doing far less well than uh, their neighboring economies with similar conditions where women are empowered to be part of the workforce. Um, <coughs> And so we're kind of churning through these things, and we're thinking about what we could possibly do to help in these communities. And so the next thing we knew is that globally, 80% of the world lives on less than $10 a day, and 3 billion people around the world live on less than $3 a day. So whatever we did had to be a cheap solution, OK? Had to be inexpensive, had to be easy to access. Um, so we already talked about this. 
So this represents, to me, what we call, a, what I would call a market deficiency. This is a place where, oh, geez. This is a place where, um, okay, this is my first time trying this remote, so it's not working that well. This is a place where uh, the market has failed to serve these people, or has not yet tried to serve these people. So I'm a, I'm a diehard capitalist. I really believe that for many, many things around the world, you can solve problems by engaging market-based solutions. And that's what impact investing is about. It's about using the marketplace to try and make people's lives better. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So on top of that, if you're bringing these people into the capitalist system, you're creating new consumers for our products, for their products, and you're growing the entire global economy. At least that's the theory. Now, it doesn't always work that cleanly, but this is what we're getting at. And so what we did is the White House and the State Department paired up with the Aspen Institute. You guys familiar with the Aspen Institute? You heard of it? Okay, so, huh? Okay, so the Aspen Institute is a think tank. Uh, it was founded in Aspen, Colorado, just down the road, but its actually main offices are in Washington, D.C., and it's one of the most influential and powerful think tanks in the world. And their whole philosophy is basically around making the world a better place in any way, shape, or form, intellectually, uh, economically, you name it. They're, they're trying to do good. And so we paired up with them, and we brought in... Um, we brought in industrial partners. We brought in Phillips and Coleman, and we started talking about what it would take to build a clean cook stove. And it was actually Phillips that came up with the idea. What would it take to build a really cheap little stove, okay, that we could then use to sell in the developing world, grow economies, invest in shops, and alleviate some of these problems we were talking about? So the solution for the market deficit was this thing. Uh, the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves which is a, a group of about 15 companies, along with the three partners that I mentioned, developed these clean cook stoves. And this right here is like a, like a $7 model. Uh, it's got an on-off switch. There's like a $15 model that has three burner settings and on and on and up until you get to about $160. And that one is like a little kitchenette. You've got like an easy bake oven and a stove top and, and they're actually pretty nice. Um, but we didn't give these things away, right? This isn't four and eight. We're not, we're not giving charity here. Why? Who here has an opinion on foreign aid? <laughs> okay, yes. <coughs> oh. Um, you're better off to teach a man how to fish than to give him a fish. Okay. Teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man, or teach, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll never go hungry. One more? I would just say like foreign aid typically goes to the governments or the sovereignty, and if you're giving it to countries that actually need this aid, their governments are not fully equipped to handle the issue, so it's not going to be benefit the people. The, so are you the, worrying about corruption? Trickle, exactly what the picture is saying, the trickle-down effect. It doesn't trickle down to the people that need it most. Yeah. State to state. Okay, you, the two of you actually nailed both of my points. One is aid tends to lead towards corruption. Um, time and again, we hear stories of aid going to the wrong people, money going to the wrong people, food being hoarded, and people suffering. Um, the other point is that you create a dependency problem. You know, it, it aid, the unintended side effect of aid is that you end up in a situation where people forget or never learn the skills they need to be self-sustaining. So now, why would we, why would we sell this stuff? What, what, what would be the, what would be the, these people don't have a lot of money, why would we, why would we try to sell them a product? Ah, you guys are a smart group. Last time I did this, I really had to pull teeth to get this because it makes them feel like they earned it. So the analogy I like to use is, how many people here own a nice pair of sunglasses? Yeah, a bunch of you, right? Now, how many people here have gone to like at a concert or an event where they just give sunglasses away? Okay, so you've got, you've got a nice pair of Ray-Bans and you've got these cheapies that were given away. Which one are you more likely to take care of? Ray-Bans, right? You're gonna take care of the nice ones. So we, we wanted people to feel invested in this. We wanted people to feel like they were a part of a system. They were buying into their own success, okay? So why would we make different levels? What's the point of making different levels? Now this is a little more insidious, and this is where this gets a little, little mucky, okay? Any guesses? So they keep buying in, yeah. You guys are really sharp. Um, yeah, 
I mean, this could sound a little bit like social engineering, but um, what we wanted is for people to jump into this and say, hey, hey, my neighbor got a better stove. I need to get that stove. That stove's really cool. I want that one. And keep buying up the system. Now, why? Well, that encourages people to go back to the store in their local area. We're not selling these on Amazon.com. We're selling these in little bodegas in the villages where these people live. So these are people going back to the stores and upgrading and working harder and trading in and moving up the capitalist ladder, okay? So, so far, Phillips and Coleman have actually made back money on their investment. This has been two years. Phillips and Coleman are making money off of this. Uh, not much. Uh, the program was never intended to make much, but it was designed to be an experiment. What do you guys think about this? How does this, how does this hit you? You like it? Promotes competitiveness. Promotes competitiveness. Okay. Anybody else? You, please. Um, I just have a question. Um, so, I mean, it's cool that you have, you know, like a stove that people are buying into, but people can't possibly buy everything that they would need. And how and how would impact investing help people get the things that they really need for? Like what? Like. Um, for example, I don't know, like, like water and food, for example. Right, right, right. So, like, how would you do water and food in the form of impact investing? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that for a minute. We're gonna come back to it at the end because that's, that's a very, very good question. I'll tell you about some of the stuff that we're working on now. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead, but I won't forget that because it's very good. Um, so what impact investing is all about is about creating long-term value across a wide spectrum, right? So by doing this, we're not, you know, Coca-Cola has done a lot of work in the space of impact investing. Why? Why is Coca-Cola giving away water? Why is Coca-Cola giving away water in Southeast Asia? Well, they're doing it because they know that that's helping them develop consumers. They're developing brand loyalty, okay? They know that they're not gonna get very many more customers in Indiana, but in India, they might, and they probably will if they do it right. And we're seeing this time and again. There's a book that just came out. If you, guys are, um, if you guys are interested in this, there's a great book that just came out called Reverse Innovation. And it's all about how innovations that are happening far, far away from here are affecting the way we live and the way we do business in the States. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, so we're going to jump back to the US for a second. So why are we talking about this now? And why did I ask you about the financial crisis to begin with? What do these two things have to do with one another? Well, I've got a friend, uh, a guy by the name of David Blood. Um, and David, very smart guy, Dartmouth undergrad, Harvard Business School, uh, became the CFO of Goldman Sachs, actually their youngest CFO in history. Uh, and he spent about eight years at Goldman. And he was a, he's always been a student of Warren Buffett. You guys heard of Warren Buffett? OK. So Warren Buffett claims that he learned everything he knows about investing from a book that was published in 1939 called Values Investing, okay? And Values Investing basically talks about this idea of investing in companies that have real underlying value. And underlying value are things like companies that make things, companies that produce things, companies that have a steady consumer. So David was sitting on the trading floor at Goldman Sachs a couple years ago, and he heard two of the younger analysts <coughs> talking about stuff talking about investment stuff. And the conversation turned, and one of the analysts turned to the other and said, why do you think that stock XYZ was doing this and this and oscillating like this on a given day or in a given hour? And David said that his, his stomach just turned over. He said, this is not what investing is about. I don't care what a stock does on a given day because a stock's behavior on a given day has nothing to do <coughs> with the value of the company. Now, I mean, okay, granted, Lehman Brothers happens, the company falls apart. That has to do with a lot of things, the underlying value. But on average, the way that Apple moves on a given day, the way that GM moves on a given day, that doesn't have a lot to do with what the company's actually about. It has to do with things like speculation. It has to do with things like spikes in commodities prices, things that are really intangible to the investment market. But David said, I want to invest in things that have a future. I want to invest in things for months and years, not just days. With, with computerized investing now, it, stock trades happen in nanoseconds. And it's too quick for anything real to happen. 
So he left Goldman Sachs and he started an investment vehicle. Um, he's based out of London now. He started with 500 million bucks. He's now, the vehicle is now worth $11 billion. And he spent his entire time investing in companies where he plans to invest for at least six months, if not a year. He invests in companies that he believes are sound, companies that he believes are creating real value. So let me ask you guys, what do you, what do you think financial markets are there for? What do financial markets do? Yes. Financial, uh, the purpose of financial markets is to promote growth in the like global economy. I mean, it's to give companies flexibility and in investments to continue to grow and innovate. Great answer. You guys all hear that? Okay, so financial markets are there to provide, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ad-lib a little bit, but financial markets are there to provide liquidity and aid, aid, aid growth for companies. Now, i got to tell you, when I, when I did the same talk for the ethics boot camp uh, last spring, uh, the first answer I got was for people to make money. I was like, no, no, no. Just like Professor C was talking about earlier, money, making money, reaping profits off the of financial markets is, it's a side. It's, it's the side dish. It's the benefit. The financial markets are really there. You buy into a company when you buy a stock, and that company can grow. They can buy new equipment. They can hire new employees. They can invest in new innovations. And in return, they give you a percentage of their earnings, and they give you a dividend to say thank you. But you're helping move the economy forward. Now, you guys are paying attention, I think, more than the group that I was with last year, because simply by that answer, I know that you're seeing things are changing in the business world. Um, I saw an amazing statistic not too long ago that polled um, incoming business students uh, into MBA programs and business students leaving MBA programs at Ivy League universities. On the way in, when they were asked what they wanted their legacy to be, they all said one thing make an impact, create something. On the way out, overwhelmingly, their answer had changed to make money. Now, I don't know what's going on in business school that's doing this. I didn't go to business school. But there's something not right about that. That just, that just irks me. So I devoted the last couple years of my career into impact investing. And so we asked the question, can we create long-term market-based solutions for problems domestically here in the US. So I jumped on a bandwagon and started talking to, has anybody here heard the name Cory Booker? Okay, so, okay, I got two hands in the back. You guys from Jersey? No? Okay, that's, that's good. You haven't heard, you've heard from out of Jersey. Um, so Cory Booker is the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. Um, and I got to know the mayor a couple years ago. We've kind of been batting around ideas of different things we could play with in the city government. We started playing with this concept of developing a strategy for the city to focus on impact investing, to focus on social entrepreneurship. That's the other word we use for it. And so we built Impact Newark. Uh, impact Newark is a cooperative partnership uh, between the city government of Newark, New Jersey, the Clinton Global Initiative. You guys heard of the Clinton Global Initiative? Anybody? Okay, one, two, couple hands. So Clinton Global Initiative is an organization that President Clinton started after he left office. Um, it was basically his way of saying, okay, I have the biggest, baddest, coolest network of friends on the planet. I know everyone and anybody who's in a position of power, and I am too young to just retire now that I'm not president anymore, so I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna kick some ass and do some cool stuff in the world. So CGI developed into an organization where ideas like this could come in and try to build cool, interesting, innovative stuff. Um, and so this is what we're talking about. How do we use the resources of city government, bring in national partners, um, and, and build an economic model for the 21st century that really makes sense, that's based on value? And so these are some of our partners. Um, you guys might know some of the names up here. Um, so we took the lessons that we learned from international development took the lessons from all over the world and said, how can we apply these in a US city? And so we're working on this right now. We just launched in June, um, and it's been a busy couple of months. We're in the process right now of raising 10 million bucks. I can tell you, begging for $10 million is not easy. <laughs> um, and what we're gonna do with that money is build a cooperative workspace. We're gonna invest directly in companies. Are you guys familiar with the term cooperative workspace? Okay, so cooperative workspace is a place where entrepreneurs can go 
and rent a desk for an hour or a week. They don't have to invest in a whole office space. They can just go and have a place to work. Um, this is really key, especially in the social enterprise world, because so many of these companies are starting with very little capital, okay? And so to give these people a place to work, to commingle with other entrepreneurs, to meet with investors, huge, right? And then the other thing we're doing is bringing in venture capital, we're bringing in private equity, we're bringing in funding sources to meet with these people. So as their ideas turn into action, they have a way to pay for it. And so we're work working on innovative ways, I'm just gonna put all these up here. Working on innovative ways to support veterans. You got a veteran here? Right on. So we're working on, have you ever heard of uh, The Mission Continues? Uh, so we've got, this, we've got this really neat organization called The Mission Continues. It was started by a guy named Eric Greitens. Um, and I'll just tell you Eric's story because he's kind of amazing. So he's a Duke grad, uh, then he got a Rhodes Scholarship, and then he was like, well, I don't know what to do with my life. So he joined the Navy and became a Navy SEAL. So he has a PhD from Oxford and he's a Navy SEAL. Okay, so a little bit of an overachiever, right? So Eric came back from being a SEAL and said, I don't know what to do now, but I really want to help veterans engage their community. And the idea was basically that when vets come back, uh, they want to continue to serve. A lot of them want to continue to serve. And I've got a bunch of friends right now who are vets who are running for elected office around the country. But for some vets, they don't want to go into public service. They don't, they don't want to go into public office. They don't want to work for the government. We see social entrepreneurship as another way for them to support their community. And so Eric started this organization um, called The Mission Continues. And what they do is essentially give vets fellowships to, to work in their communities and build companies like this and create cool things. Uh, so we're working with them. We're helping fund a bunch of these fellows in Newark. Um, we're also working on programs to employ ex-convicts. I mean, the penal system in this country has gotten a little out of control, right? And there's this thing called the prison industrial complex. We spend a lot of money to pe keep people in, in prison. And when they come out, it's really hard for them to get jobs. And so they become wards of the state. They end up on welfare. And they end up on other government programs, government subsidized programs. Um, so we're working, on, we're working on helping companies grow that want to employ ex-cons. So we've got a moving company. Uh, we got a moving company. Would you guys, would you guys let a, a group of ex-convicts move your furniture? <laughs> Most people say no. So th this concept started in North Carolina uh, with a group called Bull City Forward. And in three years, with competitive pricing and great customer service, it became the number one moving company in North Carolina. Okay. So people are, and, and there's an intense screening process and a lot of work has to go into it. Um, but there is a way to do this. Um, you asked about food. So here in the US, we're working on something in Newark that I think could have huge potential around the world. Um, we've got a series of food programs in Newark. Uh, we're developing community gardens. We're developing farmers markets. Uh, one of the biggest humps there was getting people to be able to use food stamps at farmers markets. Last year in, uh, in Newark, people spent $70 million in food stamps. Um, and now people will be able to spend those not in their King Super supermarket, but in their community gardens. And they'll be able to buy food from their neighbors. And that'll reinvest in the community in a way that wasn't possible before. Uh, the other thing we're doing is we've got a company that can grow organic fruits and vegetables inside shipping containers using hydroponics and aeroponics. Now, when I heard this the first time, I was like, well, that, that sounds kind of crazy. Does that actually work? A friend of mine looked at me and said, you're from Colorado, right? I was like, yeah. He said, dude, they've been growing pot like that for years. <laughs> Got it. So it does work. Um, right? <laughs> he just woke up. Um, so, and we're finding new and innovative ways like this to put technology to use in the community. And so like with these food containers, this is a company that will be based in Newark and will serve Newark, but this is also a company that can work with USAID and, and large international NGOs and feed people around the world. Imagine being able to put one of these things on the ground the day after an earthquake in Haiti and people will be feeding themselves within a few weeks. Like this is, this is the kind of potential that we're talking about. Um, so really, what, what does all this mean? What, what does it mean to put technology to work on the ground? Why, why, why should we care about this? And how are all these things connected? Well, I think the reality of the world that we live in today is that because of toys like this, uh, because of iPhones, because of cell phones, because of the internet, Skype, whatever you want to use, it, we are all becoming more and more connected. That's pretty obvious, right? You guys have friends from around the world, you still talk to them. You communicate on Facebook, easy, right? It's getting harder and harder to ignore what happens in the poorest communities around the world. And 
I really, really think that as we, as we look to ways to bring our economy back, a lot of those solutions are not going to come from the U.S. I believe that talent is distributed evenly around the world. The difference between talent in this room and talent in North Africa is access. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. I was, um, I traveled with the, the Vice President and the Secretary of State to uh, Marrakesh uh, in January for a Global Innovation Summit that was hosted in conjunction with the Aspen Institute. And I was hanging out and, and, and meeting great people and I, I had this amazing experience. This guy walked up to me and he said, he saw my name badge, he said, you're, you're Gordon Bronson. Yeah, hi. He said, oh, sorry, my, my name's Atul. And this guy, by the way, was, was like six foot six, bald head, just like a weird looking guy to walk up to you in the middle of a crowd that you'd never seen before and say, hi, I'm, I said, oh yeah? He said, oh, Monel Tahawe told me to find you. I said, oh, okay, friend of Mona's, okay. So Mona's an old friend of mine, I've only met her once, but we talk a lot on Twitter, okay? And we talk on the phone sometimes. Mona lives in Egypt. Um, it turns out that Atul was being honored as one of the great tech minds of his generation from the Middle East. The tool had grown up outside of Cairo and using a dial-up internet connection had taught himself C++ programming language and was now writing a software that was beating Google in its ability to learn your search patterns. Okay, so this guy that grew up in like what could generously be called a mud hut was beating one of the most powerful companies in the world with all their engineers. And all this guy needed to take the next step was a little bit of help. That's what impact investing is all about, is helping guys like that, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell you a follow-up to the story. Uh, Mona, um, Mona el Tahawi, who I mentioned, is a journalist with the AP. And she was in Cairo, in Tahrir Square, during the heat of the Arab, of the Arab Spring, okay? And, um, I got a call a couple of months ago from a friend, the State Department, when I was still at the White House, and he said, check your Twitter feed right now. Okay, so I pulled up my phone and I opened up Twitter. And Mona, a million miles away, had sent out a tweet saying, I'm arrested, help. Okay, so it's four o'clock in the morning and my friend Rob and I are starting to get on the calls and do the things that you know, you do when you have a friend who's in trouble and you have the, have the ability to call the White House switchboard and say, hey, can we, can we get into this? Can we do something about this? Um, and it turns out when Mona was arrested in Tahrir Square uh, for protesting for no apparent reason, um, uh, she was uh, beaten by the police, she was sexually assaulted. Um, and when she came out, the next tweet that Mona sent out, eight hours later, was a photo of her broken arm Okay, it turns out she had broken her arm, broken her ankle, pretty bad shape. Photo of her broken arm and a tweet with it that said, arms broken, released, wait till you see the article I'm gonna write about you, you fuckers. <laughs> so my point with this is that as we're, as we're helping develop economies around the world, as we're investing in these kind of projects, it seems now like we don't even have a choice. We're so connected around the world and what happens over there matters here. What happened to Mona matters to me. So as you guys go out and become the leaders of your family businesses, become the leaders of the businesses in your community, think about what it means to invest in value. I beg of you, think about what it means to invest in the long term. Not just what's gonna happen tomorrow, but what's gonna happen 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Because I promise you that it will come back either in a good way or it'll come back to bite you on the ass. So with that, thank you and I'll take any questions you have. We got a mic. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, when you were talking about accessibility and how you give access to those people, mm -hmm. I mean, in like developing countries, there are just so many people in need of some sort of help, help. in some way. How do you plan on giving access to so, so, so many people yeah. in such a, I guess, broad way? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I'm gonna. Okay, I'll be quick, because I gotta send you guys back over in a second. Um, so I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story. There was, um, uh, when, the, when the gay rights, when the LGBT movement was just getting started, 
um, in the 60s and 70s, largely in San Francisco. Um, there were a lot of attempts to get bills passed. At the time, there were a lot of anti-sodomy laws, a lot of really nasty, hateful things in the books. And um, there was a lot of attempts to get, get big, sweeping pieces of legislation passed to, to try and make the problem better. And they all failed. Across the board, they all failed. Uh, Mid-70s, um, a, a seemingly small group of activists in Washington, D.C. petitioned the Library of Congress to change a very small piece of language um, in the way that the Library of Congress classified books and literature about homosexuality. And they changed it from like uh, sexual abnormalities and deviations to like homoerotic love or like whatever it was. And they changed it just a little bit so the language is like just a little less, you know, jarring. And somehow, after that, uh, groups all over the country were able to use that change as a platform to stand on, to say, look, we've got momentum, we've got things happening, we're gonna change the world. And after that, you had guys like Harvey Milk and a bunch of other civil rights activists being elected up and down the western and eastern seaboards. Why did I bring that up? Why does that matter? Well, one of the organizations I work with is a group called Village Capital, and they're, uh, their, their role is they invest, they do fellowship classes in different countries around the world. They take a half a million bucks and they invest in 10 entrepreneurs. 10 entrepreneurs. If you're talking about a country with, you know, 300 million people in it, what, what does that matter? It's creating cues, it's creating small changes. But if those 10 entrepreneurs create companies with value and they go out and aid 10 more entrepreneurs, 10 more entrepreneurs, it's a step in the right direction. And the more we can support organizations like that, I think the better off we'll be. But it's a great question. It's, it's a hard and it's a slow process. But I think if you get just one entrepreneur in motion, if you change one thing, um, you'll be able to see big <laughs> effects over the, over the course of a lifetime. Does that kind of answer, Sartu? Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Bring it. So, so, I had him last year. Since no one's challenged you yet, uh, I figure I might as well. Um, last year I asked you this pretty, pretty much the same question. Uh, you have a lot of nonprofits that kind of are, are known for, in my opinion, overpaying their CEOs and overpaying their management staff. So you're, you're talking a lot about uh, impact investing. What's to keep, you, they, at their heart, yeah, they have, a, they have a great message, they have a great mm -hmm. purpose, but what's keeping these companies from basically making one person really rich at the expense of everybody else. I mean, yeah. yes, it is a for-profit company and they're paying a CEO when the profits who, that are going to that CEO could be going back into the company and could be going back sure. to the people they're trying to help. Sure. So why is this good and what's keeping that from happening? Yeah, so I'll give, I don't know if this is the answer I gave you last year, but I, I, um, I think the difference is when you're dealing with companies that are, that are market-based, they make their money off of customers. If there's no customers, there's no money to be made. Um, you know, the fact that uh, CEO Greenpeace pays themselves $500,000 a year, I think, is nuts. Um, but if the CEO of our growing company, the company that's growing these organic fruits and vegetables, if the market determines that his customer base lends him to get a million dollars a year, I'm great with that. Because this guy has gone out and created value and aided to the community. And if he wants to reinvest that in his business, it's his choice. But when the money's not coming from donations, I say run with it. <laughs> All right, I think I gotta send you, what time are you guys supposed to be over there? Any idea what, the next, what time the next group goes? 08.10? Oh, yeah, you guys should probably get out of here. Listen, you guys have been great, thank you so much.